is the forever. No, I won't let you do just one appendectomy. But I'm a man. But not a doctor. Can I talk to a doctor? You are talking to a doctor. Can I need a clicky pen? No. <laughs> sure. No. Yeah, no. no. doctor. Somebody get security. It's Bobby. Thank you, Amos. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Inon, for joining us. Uh, together here with me is Ambassador uh, Ido Aroni, who will help me uh, in interviewing uh, Inon. And just for, for the order, so we'll be talking for... Uh, Ido and I will be talking for around 35, 40 minutes. We'll be talking to, uh, to Inon, and then we'll open it for questions to the audience. Okay, so that's... Uh, you'll have time to ask your own questions. Uh, so you know, welcome. It's uh, uh, really nice to have you here. You know, welcome back home. Uh, we're excited to have you. And my sincere apologies for leaving early. You know all about commitments of, of uh, in leadership positions. So I need to open a ceremony of, uh, <laughs> in one of our programs. And that leads me to my first question. You do a lot of things. And it takes a lot of time, and you raise kids, and you, uh, your wife is here. I thought I saw her at a, at a certain point. She's at the back. Uh, she's at the back where you yeah. can... Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, and I met Liam, your daughter, at a certain point, and she's wonderful. She's, she's at Warden now, right, at UPenn? Right. And you, so obviously you did a great job in raising kids. So perhaps you can tell us you know, how your, your schedule looks like on a daily basis. And how do you handle it all? Because I think that's uh, one of the struggles that we leadership positions have, balancing and, and handling it all. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for coming and hosting me here today. It's, it's an honor for me and a privilege. Uh, I kind of apologize for doing it in English. I would have loved to do it in Hebrew, given the audience, but I know they're broadcasting it over the web, so it's in English. Um, so it's great to be back. I used to go to school here in this very building, and it's great to be uh, kind of come full circle and be here again. Um, so it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a kind of a tough question to, to respond. It, it is about managing your time effectively. Family is always uh, first, and this is all the thanks to my wife, Anat, who uh, is in charge of the house of raising four uh, kids um, uh, inside five years. Uh, apart, so it's a very busy household. <laughs> and of course, at Mattel, Mattel is a large operation, large uh, global company, and I'm blessed to have an incredible leadership team that, um, that is very, very strong, very diverse, very um, uh, effective in running the company day to day. My job is to, is to really empower the team. It is to promote collaboration, stimulate innovation, and drive execution uh, to make sure that we uh, are successful in what we do. And in the middle of all of it, you have a lot of unforeseen, unplanned activities. So sometimes you have to be quick, you have to be nimble. And as a company, we really designed the organization to be flexible and responsive so we can uh, address changes and be able to navigate in a busy world and a changing landscape by the day. That's uh, but, uh, you know I, I want to dig just a little bit deeper. It's not in the question. How do you how does your day look like? When when are you waking up? When do you go to the gym? I mean, how do you handle all of that? Well, I'll give you a bit of a bit maybe more than you need to know. But I, <laughs> but I, I do I do wake up uh, early without an alarm clock. Normally at around five. Uh, I'm not going to attest to that. I normally start the day um, at, at the gym while I watch uh, Israeli news. So I keep oh, wow. up with things that happen uh, in Israel pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, and then I start early with my, um, uh, to address emails that came over the overnight and things that happened while I was asleep. And then uh, the day starts normally pretty early and you finish, you know, the day varies, every day is different. Sometimes you travel, sometimes it's in Los Angeles, sometimes winning at the office, sometimes outside the office, every day is different. Um, but it is uh, really uh, all in all about how do you do the right thing for the company, how do you continue to advance our business and uh, create more opportunities and, and follow uh, our mission as a, as a global organization that has um, an important role in society and, and real um, uh, responsibility to do the right things by, by, by our consumers. 
that's interesting, and I, I, I want to go back to the, uh, to the trailer that we've just seen. Obviously, Barbie is huge. It's huge as a product, and now it's going to be huge as a movie. And it's part of your strategy that we'll hear, I'll probably ask you a direct question about your strategy soon. But I do want to ask about something that is related to this school. So those of you who don't know, Will Ferrell, who plays Inon in the movie, Will Ferrell is an American icon. It's really, Amer I mean, the classical, the most probably most famous Will Ferrell movies where he played the NASCAR driver named uh, uh, Ricky Bobby. And, you know, I grew up, I spent 10 years in the South, south, south Southern United States, and, you know, there is a, um, a saying there, it's called, Dear Lord Baby Jesus. So it's, it's really something that is ingrained within the American culture, and all of a sudden, this American icon plays an Israeli guy <laughs> and, uh, that, you know, graduated from Tel Aviv University. And, and this is not in the movie. <laughs> not for and, uh, and so... so how do you feel about, I mean, have you, when you graduated, have you ever thought that this is what's going to happen? This is how you imagine your career taking this path? Well, Will Ferrell has been one of my favorite actors ever since Zoolander, if you remember that yeah, uh, right. iconic movie. Uh, and, you know, it, the movie is very much about uh, self-deprecation and self-awareness, and we embrace that as a company. Um, so uh, it is uh, uh, somewhat of, a, of an experience to be uh, to have Will Ferrell play the Mattel CEO, and I can tell you he gets away with a lot more than I can. Uh, and we have very different leadership styles, but he can afford that. And uh, all in all, it's it's uh, it will be you know self-deprecation will be part of what the movie um, manifests, and 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 all part of a great experience uh, to to create something that is very. Uh, unique for um, for audiences all over the world. And did you have this? So, what did you plan on doing when you graduated? I mean, did you plan on being a CEO of one of the largest toy companies in the world, or is this something that you just ran into? Actually, when I when I was still in the military, I I, I wanted to do my uh, graduate school in in business in the U.S. So I I this was a few years kind of plan I had to finish the military I wanted to travel for two years I needed to study uh, I wanted to study in Israel in in Tel Aviv University uh, in economics and management so I can have higher chances of getting into an American school where I wanted to study an MBA so it was a bit of a plan um, uh, seven years of of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, uh, of a journey and I, I was hoping to be able to uh, get into the entertainment industry in some fashion, um, and you know, at that stage, clearly, at, at when you're still in the military, you don't have a complete path, and this is pre-internet, so access to information was not as easy and, and available as it is today. But directionally, this was my my um, uh, where I was trying to, to to head at that at that age, and I have to say that um, Tel Aviv University served. Uh, a, a very important role for me uh, in, in that it, it uh, really the academically the level of education and skills that you acquire uh, here were at the highest level and definitely prepared me for my graduate school at, uh, at uh, UCLA uh, at one of the top schools in America uh, in, in business and helped me uh, be able to without you know from where I started to be in a better position to graduate from that school and continue the journey onwards from there. Amazing. So let me let me start focusing on Mattel because you know, it wasn't in a good shape when you arrived. Actually, there were people in the market that were concerned about its ability, about Mattel's ability to even survive. You know, bonds below investment grade, and, and you know it wasn't probably wasn't the best investment during those years, and you arrived and you completely reshaped the opportunity, uh, reshaped the company. What opportunities have you seen in Mattel that made you actually take this job? And if you could tell us more, give us some more color about the transformation that you made there. Yeah, so I, I always admired and revered Mattel as one of the most iconic companies in corporate America, even when I was in my early uh, the, the early days of my career in the children's uh, entertainment uh, business in Europe. And I, uh, I 
Mattel w did go through a period of uh, challenges and uh, several years of decline. And I was offered to join the board in uh, 2017, which I thought would be interesting to be part of uh, a company in, 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 um, in, in a need of transformation. And after, shortly after I joined the board, I was offered to become chairman uh, uh, of the company, initially non-executive chairman and then executive chairman. And before I was formally appointed, the prior CEO, CEO uh, stepped down. And I then was offered to become um, uh, a CEO. And effectively, it was the fourth CEO in four years um, of, of the company. But I, I truly believe that we have an incredible opportunity to transform the company given the quality assets that we own in, in, uh, in some of the strongest brands in children and family entertainment in the world. And we actually believe that next to Disney, we own the strongest portfolio in children and family entertainment. Now, at that point, there was no, you know, when I stepped into the job, the, I, I, the directionally and instinctively, I knew there would be opportunities. Clearly, when you do that, there's no playbook there's no uh, 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 a predefined formula to do that, but I knew there's a lot to work with, given the quality of the company, the quality of the people, and the standing of the company. And the transformation was very much about evolving from being a toy manufacturing company that was making items to become an IP company that is managing franchises. Mm. And the re realization for us was that the people who buy our product are not just consumers, they are fans. And once you realize that you have an audience of fans, then opportunities uh, come your way and become uh, a lot bigger than, than being only in the toy business. That's brilliant. You moved from intangible, from tangible business to intangible business. That's fascinating. Well, we, we didn't move away from the toy business. The toy business is actually a great business to be when things work. And, and it's a growing industry. It's, uh, it's a large, about a hundred billion dollar uh, of global uh, business in, in, in this category alone. So it's a large business, but a large industry. So when things work well, it's a great place to be. But the opportunity was to grow in addition to what we do on the toy side, outside of the toy aisle, and leverage the assets that we own to participate in other highly accredited business verticals, such as film, television, live events, consumer product and merchandise, music, digital experiences, parks, and many other verticals that are also driven by big brands, big franchises that are, that are, that are critical to rise above the rest of uh, the competition. And given that we own this asset, the opportunity for us is to expand beyond, not instead of, but beyond and in addition to what we do in the toy side of the company. Fascinating. So, in addition to, to the day-to-day -day activity and you know, strengthening the financial strength of Mattel, thinking about strategy, being a CEO of such a big corporation, global corporation, requires significant leadership skills. And I'm, I wonder whether you can help us to try to understand how you see leadership and what are the qualities that you think are important for uh, leaders especially in a global corporate? You know, every person has a different style. One is Will Ferrell, uh, <laughs> and then everything is from there onwards. But the, you know, the, uh, the, the company is a large uh, operation. We have uh, tens of thousands of people working uh, all over the world. Uh, in order to reposition the company, we had to take on a major restructuring. We uh, reduce our cost base by uh, over a billion dollars in, um, in, uh, in, in, in three years. We had to reduce the headquarter, uh, the, 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 corporate, uh, the corporate workforce by over 30% or almost 35% from uh, 13 and a half thousand to eight and a half thousand, so 5,000 less jobs in the company. And in the process, grow our business with less, less people, less resources. Uh, and, and, and we exited five factories and grew our output in, in, in doing that. So sometimes when you go through a major transformation like that, you actually go through a period of, of, um, of decline in order to then come back again. As a public company in a very competitive industry, you don't have that luxury. You can't 
park the car, uh, step aside, do what you have to do, and then come back and continue driving. You actually have to do it um, while you are competing in a, in a very um, sophisticated marketplace. And we were able to do that largely through an excellent team that we, that we assembled. And as a CEO, your role is to, is to attract the best people and create an environment where you can amplify their skills, their capabilities, and lead by consensus uh, with a large team. No one CEO can be in every place and do everything by yourself. It's all about empowering the team, uh, des designing an organization that can take on challenges, and, and you continue to, to, um, uh, to, to lead by or around a very clear purpose and mission. And this is one of the things that was very important to us and one thing I focused early on is to create a very clear purpose for Mattel and a, a very clear mission. Mm. You know, our mission is, is to create innovative products and experiences that inspire, entertain and develop children through play. And when you galvanize the organization around that mission with the purpose of empowering the next generation to explore the wonder of childhood and reach their full potential, when that purpose and that mission are clear and you define your brand purpose, your leadership values, your product attributes, things become much more clear to the organization. And we took, we used to have, uh, before the transformation, there was a, Mattel had a, a strategy that was articulated in a three inch thick document. <laughs> this was, it was a strategy document that was that thick. And we brought it down to one page. Not that it's easy to execute, but at least it's very clear what is our journey. And each and every person of our team all over the world has their own goals and objectives that ladder up to the corporate purpose and mission. And every person knows exactly what they're supposed to achieve and do in order to, to um, uh, aim at our goals and be very focused on, on uh, execution, on, uh, on, on achieving uh, results, They're being very performance oriented. We also became very flexible uh, in the process and gave our own people much more ownership and flexibility of the day to day and control of their time. Uh, and it, 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 it's, it, some things are obvious, some, some things are more subtle in the way you manage a company. For example, we have an unlimited vacation policy at Mattel. Really? Unlimited vacation policy where we actually don't measure and take uh, or record time when people take a vacation. This is something that we trust our people to manage themselves. There's no department that manages that area. Everyone is in charge of their own vacation and time off as long as they work it out with the manager and continue to get um, to, to do their job. And so that trust and that empowerment is part of the, the culture at Mattel. Wow. That's, uh, that's fascinating. It's actually very difficult to do an output-based measurement rather than input. That's, exactly. uh, that's we'll hear better. So before I, uh, before I give uh, the time to, uh, to Ido, that I know you know each other for a while, and Ido probably has a gazillion more time experience in me in the movie industry, uh, and uh, Ido, despite I'm better looking. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, well, of the three of us, the only one that looks like a movie star is him. That's, that's true. Uh, that's true. He does uh, my PR as well. Uh, yes. <laughs> Always him. But, but you talked about mission, and I know purpose is really important to you, and ESG is really important to you. ESG, environmental, social governance, to those of you I know, we had a conference about it lately. And you know I'm I'm a classical capital market guy, right? So I'm a, you know I'm a finance person who is extremely skeptical about those all, all those ESG matrices and and what have you, because at the end you know I look and I see a lot of money uh, wasting uh, uh, greenwashing machines, and I know it's different in Mattel, and uh, it seems like the market actually believe you. I actually get. <laughs> Uh, you know, as, as, as a father of a young child and a four-year-old daughter, I get uh, um, very touched by seeing, you know, a black Barbie or a black doll and, and an astronaut and a doctor. So that's, uh, uh, that's very touching. 
Uh, that being said, you know, Margot Ruby, the classical blonde American girl, is playing Barbie in the movie. And, you know, I, I was wondering about your thoughts about how to reconcile all those competing forces about resources, about values, about, because that's, you know, from my experience, balancing it all in this corporate setting, is, as you mentioned, you have tough competitors, you know, every dollar counts. And how do you balance it all in, you know, together with the values that you try to bring to the table? Yeah, the, the thing about Mattel as a company, what we do has real societal impact. We have real cultural impact. We shape the next generation. We partner with parents, with families, and we influence children at a very young and formative age. And we take that very seriously. And as a company, we defined uh, our goal to contribute to a more, a more diverse, equitable, inclusive, and sustainable future. And this is not just a lip service or a slogan. It's actually embedded in, in how we operate, how we manage a company, how we design our product, how we, this is in, how we think about our franchise management inside the company, not just how we talk externally. And it's, it has to be authentic, it has to be organic to what we do, especially when you deal with children who are the most sophisticated uh, consumer out there. And, and if, if this is not authentic and this is, if this is not real, uh, they smell it out very quickly. So what we do uh, is, is across multiple aspects of the company, we are a commercial enterprise, so it has to fit into a, a commercial equation because theoretically, even if all of your product can be sustainable today, it might not be economical. So you have to do it incrementally and over time achieve your goals. But, but this designing product that speaks to diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is, is endemic, is part of what we do. The Barbie strategy to, uh, and brand purpose to empower the limitless potential in every girl is very much how the brand is designed and how it is managed. The dolls that we, that we make, some that, that you mentioned, all the way to dolls with prosthetic limbs or a doll with a Down syndrome that we recently uh, released are not for marketing purposes. This is about representing the world through the eyes of children and how they see the world with room for every person uh, in, in any form and, and background. So there are more than 170 different Barbies that in different body shapes and hair color and skin tone and eye shade and any different representation. And likewise, we apply the same in other products, not just Barbie, also for in Hot Wheels or American Girl or Uno, where we create product that, has, that represents culture that also uh, advances our goals towards sustainability and, um, and uh, green, uh, the green economy. And you can't change the world by yourself, but you can continue to contribute and do it uh, very, very authentically. And it is great to see how that message and those values come through uh, our product and what we do. The Barbie movie is very much about that. It's about uh, diversity and inclusivity and it will, be, it will come out very clearly in, in, in the movie without saying too much about <laughs> the plot, but it's, uh, it is core to what we do and how we think about the world. And we have that, you know, because of the strength and reach of our brands that go back two and even three generations, you really have that, that opportunity. Play is the language that we use to speak to, to our consumers and children. And once you have that established connection, you can actually really take it and leverage it uh, in, in many different ways. And what is unique about where we are, given that our product, uh, what we do, is very tactile. Toys are very tactile. So children hold it, they hug our product, they wear it, they go to bed with it. It's aspirational and inspirational. And once you have that level of emotional connection with your fans, everything is possible. So this is not just a physical product that you buy off the shelves. People have a relationship with our product. They really, they relate, they, 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 there's, a, there's a legacy, there's heritage, there's history, and, and, and it really matters. And, and, and our job is to take that heritage and continue to evolve what we do 
so that not only it's timeless, but also it's very timely. And bridging the, the product that is both timeless and timely is the art and science of what we do and, and how we continue to evolve our, our strategy, both as a commercial organization, but also as a company that has real societal, cultural impact. No, I've, I, I heard you and it's amazing, you really care. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you talk about it and I see through your face, through your hand movement, that you actually care about that. And that's, uh, that's amazing. You know, now I'm happier that my son plays with Hot Wheels all the time. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, that's, that's wonderful and, you know, you have to you know, in, in this day and age, you really, you know, when you run, especially a company like Mattel, you have to do the right thing. And if you cut corners and if you, if you don't do the right thing by, by your product, given what we do, that it, the, at, at, the, at the most basic level, it's not good for business. Obviously, you don't do it just for business. You do it because in this day and age, it matters. And corporates have a role to play outside of uh, uh, trying to create shareholder value, which is absolutely what we try to do. Uh, the good news is that you can actually try to achieve both and not necessarily one instead of the other. Amazing. Ambassador? Either would do. Uh, well, I think to continue your line of uh, question, I think that what's amazing about what you've done, you know, is that you did it so seamlessly. It, it looks natural, and you know, uh, we all know what's happening with other brands. Uh, you don't have to say anything, but all you have to do is read about what happened to Bud Light to understand what happens when you do ESG heavy-handedly meaning in the name of inclusion, you exclude your base, your, your base, your, your consumer base, and you've done it beautifully. And I just wanted to ask you about what is your definition, because we have many students here in the room looking up to you. They dream one day to be in on Christ. And what is your definition of transformational leadership as opposed to transactional leadership? And we know uh, way too many business leaders in Israel that are transactional, not because they're bad people, but because they don't understand strategy the way you do. Well, you're giving me too much credit. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me start with that. But it's, uh, it's uh, you know, every situation is different. And of course, you have to um, adapt and, and, and manage uh, a situation in different ways. You know, I, I was privileged to be uh, at uh, uh, in different companies in different stages uh, from a startup uh, to uh, early stage companies to mid-stage companies or to Mattel which is uh, a, a 78 year old company uh, so uh, and in every situation is very different I really believe ultimately it goes down uh, to people you, know, you can talk about brands and assets and and intellectual properties and everything around but ultimately it's all about the people and, and the people inside the company, the team that you build around yourself, uh, or around the company, not yourself, yourself, but you know, around each other, mm -hmm. and how you create an environment where people can excel and be at their best. And you know, I really believe a, a good leader surrounds themselves with people that are, each of them is better than what they do uh, in, their, you know, in their expertise. And your job is to really let them be the best and bring to the table whatever they can they can achieve and and in every situation is different so there is no you know formula for it but and of course we also make mistakes and what looks seamless from the outside not always so easy from the inside and you have to course correct uh, in in real time and this is part of the journey but I think you you really have to be able to uh, quickly realize where you head in the wrong direction and, and make changes and that's part of uh, that's part of uh, that's part of the journey, and just be in tune and open-minded and flexible to take, si you know, small signals. It doesn't always you don't always get a big red Obviously. flag right. that tells you you have a problem. Sometimes it's the small signals that are more important, and you just have to be very in tune uh, to 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 what you receive from the environment around you, and and adjust. But ultimately, it is about the strength of the people uh, in each organization. 
and, and, and I think that, you know, I've known Enon for many, many years. When he met me the first time, I still had hair. Imagine how long that's that was. That's a scary thought. Yeah, that, that's a very scary thought. So we, we met, and I have this, I have images of meetings with you, and it was always about things that were extracurricular. It was never about his business. Every time we met, it's because he really cared, cared about Israel. So I remember a meeting, you came from London to talk about Israel's image. We met in my office in New York. First time we met was when Shimon Peres came to LA in September of 1994 to talk about the Oslo process. She was very interested to learning about what's happening with the Palestinians, and I was involved with that negotiations and so on. And I have, I have, and then I have the image of you at the peninsula when you joined Mattel's board, and you already spoke about your vision for uh, for the IP, for the co so I have those images. But you always really cared about the what you brought from here, your military experience, the Tel Aviv University experience. So tell us about how that you know how Israel, the core of you, met. America, the entertainment industry. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm very Israeli. Uh, you know, born and raised, of course. My parents are here. My wife is Israeli. Uh, her parents are here. Our siblings are here. Uh, we have a place here uh, for vacations, and our kids speak Hebrew, uh, not just to us, but among each other, to each other, which is the real test. Uh, so, um, you know, this is always. That's where you're from, and that's where you know that's that's your you know your origin. But um, it's great you know to have the opportunity to do what I do outside of the country. I always uh, follow very closely what happens here. Uh, every Israeli, in some ways, uh, is an ambassador, not as good as you, but <laughs> and not as formal. But we all play a role in representing Israel um, in the in the outside world, and. What is interesting, at least in the job that I have, that it's, it's, our company is very global. Uh, it's an American corporation, uh, but it's, it's a global company. And, and the world is very global in that regard. Every company I've been involved with had uh, people from literally all over the world. Um, so always very international, cosmopolitan settings. And um, this is something that I, I, I enjoy and I try to promote and create a diverse um, group of, of uh, people from everywhere. And, it, and as, as a person, you have to be able to adapt and respond and, and, and play uh, in a game of, you know, of, of, uh, of a global situation. But um, you know, caring very much about what happens here, um, following the news daily, and I don't exaggerate, it's very, you know, very daily and having still very many close friends in Israel and getting feedback from what happens here and visiting here often, uh, you always keep a very close connection to the country. Um, uh, and and not, not just for vacations, you know, because you really care. Uh, so long way to say, I don't know what in me as an Israeli that, that played a role in what I do outside of Israel. I'm sure there is. Um, you know, I, 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 it's easy to say Israeli chutzpah or all of that. I don't know if it's that. Uh, I think the concept of uh, looking, you know, aiming, looking at the board, at, at the end result, or in the way we call it, tachlis, which is not a word that really exists in other languages, um, in the same form. But being kind of tachlis about things is clearly something I focus as a person. I don't know if it's because I'm just Israeli, but definitely something that I always. Uh, Look at and say what what are, you know how do we execute what have we have we achieved what we're set out to do what is the bottom line how do we get to the end result quickly is you know well, part of the goal you know I don't want to embarrass him but people say in the industry you know gets things done never drops the ball which is saying a lot in the entertainment industry I'll give an example it just came from a, a master class which I conducted with Hollywood producer Larry Kazanov. I told them from here, Larry Kazanov is the guy who produced Mortal Kombat, Brand, True Lies, you know, lots of movies, worked for Vestron in the 1980s, if you remember Platoon, Dirty Dancing, all those movies he produced. And he said, you know, cries, I love this guy. And so that's, that's the word. Uh, people love you because you get things done. And I think that what you've done with Mattel is a perfect example 
And so we thank you for being here. And I'd like to open the floor for the questions of the audience. If you can identify yourself, your organizational affiliation. And let me just remind people that a question is a short sentence with a question mark in the end. <laughs> All right, let's start. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm an exchange student here. Um, my question is, what are you most passionate about? And um, where do you see yourself in 20 years? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very narrow, very narrow question. Uh, it, it depends what area, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, my family, my the company that I run and uh, friends and family, you know, and, and you try to balance the time between all of them. And in 20 years time, I hope to be still doing the things that I do today in new forms and new incarnations but continue to do what I do and more in, in, in being able to find my passion in those areas. <coughs> yes, please. Hi, my name is Shuli Gillis. I'm a teaching fellow here at Tokyo University and I work in the area of children's technology. And I really appreciate what you said about a win-win situation and doing what's right for children and taking responsibility that's also good for business. And my question is, how do I get more of the CEOs I work with to think like that and to get them to do what's right for kids when designing technology? How do I convince them? I can say non price that that's already great, <laughs> but what else can I say to get them to do what's right? You know, I think uh, experience shows that. And, and uh, I think when you do things, if you cut corners or if you do things that don't play, in the right way, it comes back very quickly to bite you and you get uh, the short end of the stick. And so, you know, um, the, it's, I guess if, if they tried and failed, that would be a good lesson. Um, but but uh, as I said, there's no, th there is no formula and you have to really follow uh, your values and what you believe in. And I think because what we do, it does matter. You know, and Mattel recently, about a week ago, was recognized as one of the uh, 100 most influential companies in the world in Time Magazine uh, is because of what we do, uh, because of our values and how we implement uh, uh, our, you know, our mission and purpose. So when you get positive reinforcement in that way, given how you set the, 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 the goals, that's another form of, of recognition. Yes, please. Guy. For minutes, meaningful minutes, we're building the World Time Museum. Uh, it's about Web3, Metaverse. Uh, as parents, we always want to take our kids away from the screens and give them toys and play like we used to. But in the real world, we're moving towards Web3, uh, kids like computers. How do you foresee uh, Mattel going into that, combining the toys and the screen that time? Uh, Sure. Well, we, we believe is that physical play is here to stay. And the physical toy industry has been growing for more than 10 years, uh, uh, even with the growth of technology and screen time and everything else. Part of it is because children multitask anyway. And the other reason is, is that it's, it's actually, there's so much research that talks about the positive benefits of physical play uh, in child development and empowerment and enriching experiences and driving creativity and social skills and other things. So parents promote it. Um, and, and so it's here to stay and we believe physical play will continue to grow. That said, because we own the underlying rights of, of, of the brands that, that are part of the toy, we can engage children wherever they are. And that's part of our strategy to expand outside of the toy business into games and digital experiences and NFTs and, um, and, and other opportunities. And that's part of the strategy to grow in addition to what we do on the toy side in other domains. Shmulek, please. Yeah, Shmulek ben I run the FinTech Association in Israel. Uh, you get the chance to look at the consumer behavior in so many different cultures and countries. What can you say about the Israeli consumer? Israeli consumer, well, we have our partner here, uh, uh, who represent uh, Mattel in, uh, in Israel. Israeli consumer is very sophisticated, um, you know, in, on many levels. And 
the brands that we sell here that represent Mattel, particularly Hot Wheels, Barbie, and Fisher Price, are thriving. Our business has been growing consistently over the last few years with very good uh, uh, engagement in the marketplace. And in that regard, it's interesting to see that the world is very much a big global village and brands do transcend cultures. And you know the, the strength and, and popularity and appeal of Barbie is very much uh, you know, as much as, as it is here uh, or, or, or Germany or, or Italy or any other country for that matter. And the same for Hot Wheels and Fisher Price. And especially now with the quick movement uh, of information and, and buzz and excitement, you see it uh, thriving, the, the strong brands thrive wherever they go. And that's, that's an interesting phenomenon. Yes, please. Yes, the uh, a big part of our transformation was was cultural. It was about culture, and and uh, we've done a lot of work on it together with uh, our uh, leadership team and a very strong head of uh, our uh, work for uh, head of uh, uh, chief people officer. Um, uh, a global head of HR, very strong uh, organization, a very strong focus on driving culture, and it's it's it it comes in many different ways in very uh, very strong communication and, and focus on continue to uh, engage with our team, uh, be very clear about your values, your mission, your purpose, the uh, the entire framework or you know your cultural framework, very, being very specific, very definitive and continue to advocate and promote and, and, and be tangible about it in terms of examples. It's, it, it didn't happen overnight, but the organization at the core responded very well because the things that we look to do uh, are clear and, and in many ways are obvious in, 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 in terms of our responsibility and our role in society. And the, we continue to also measure the, the, the engagement and, and, and uh, different parameters that represent culture. We surveyed the entire global organization every, uh, every six months, where, and we get typically over 90% response of, of all of our employees, tens of thousands of people, or th let's say thousands of people that respond and, 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 uh, and, and give a specific answer to their feeling, their reaction, their, the environment, how we can improve their experience at Mattel, and then we act on it. Uh, so we continue to measure those, those results. And one of the interesting things is that during the transformation of the company, uh, while we reduced the workforce by you know, 5,000 uh, positions, we also changed within the 8,500 positions that, were, that we kept in the company, we, we changed 2,700 people. So there was a lot of transition in the company. And add on top of it COVID, and all the challenges that that brought and the economy and other things. And during all of that transition, our morale and engagement went up in spite of that uh, very taxing um, uh, transformation in terms of the, on the organization. So a lot of it is thanks to, to our focus on culture and being very clear and deliberate about the journey and what are we uh, aiming to achieve. Yes, please. Hi. I'm a third year student here at the faculty and also a, a wonderful manager of the strategy student club and of the Elio Hobbits Institute. Um, my question is, how do you drive innovation within your organization, which is quite huge, but how do you actually um, manage to, to get to the, uh, each employee and implement the, the need for innovation? Well, innovation is one of our three leadership values. It's, it's collaboration, innovation, and execution. And as a company, Mattel as a company, as, as a, at, at the core, is a creative company. It's a creative organization. And, and this is something that we continue to empower and invest in 
and, and, and create uh, a fertile ground for creative people. We are trying to be a talent magnet that, that attracts, pro uh, retains, and, 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 and promotes in, uh, innovation and creativity. And it, it happens in many different ways, but we celebrate it every day. We are really focused on it as a company. It's something that I personally uh, you know, focus on and, 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 and try to promote and push and, and uh, really stimulate. And again, it, it's in many different ways. And all the companies that I've been involved with were at the core creative companies and each had its own unique market standing or core asset base, but they were all about uh, stimulating innovation in a competitive landscape. And sometimes, you know, there, there, sometimes it takes a bit of balancing in terms of how much you invest. You can't do it endlessly because you also need to be financially you know, disciplined and do it as part of running a commercial enterprise. But uh, at the core, it's something that you have to promote and push and be very mindful every day. And we truly believe that without innovation, without creativity at Mattel, we would lose our competitive advantage. And so it's something that we have to protect and, and, and promote and make sure that it continues to, to, to lead the way for us. So the current situation with, with the SEC, Gary Gensler, and the like, how has it impacted your uh, Web3 initiative? And about it, and oh, last question, uh, on the digital, uh, is it something that Mattel is going to look into? So having, buying a physical toy, like having a digital experience that goes with it. Hey, look, we, we continue to navigate what we do in a changing landscape, including regulatory, changes and any development in each market, by the way. Uh, and that's something that we became very good at. And that's something that we follow and obviously react and adapt as we go. And digital is absolutely a very key part of our strategy. Um, uh, we have a, a, a growing mobile uh, game publisher uh, that we have in partnership with NetEase, uh, uh, as, that you may know is a, one of the largest mobile publishers in the world in, in, out of China. And this is a, a very successful s startup that is already doing uh, uh, very well within very few short years. We continue to launch NFTs and create uh, experiences that bring together the physical product as well as the uh, digital expressions. Uh, and often our NFTs are selling out Im almost immediately. And it's something that you continue to evolve and innovate because the, the market is still forming as you know and it's changing but we the opportunity for us is to is to leverage the engagement that people have with our physical product and transcend it to the digital world where people obviously spend significant time and this is really how you bring together and marry the two worlds to create a, a unique experience that 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 continues to change and create excitement uh, for for your fans so you, you always have to evolve and create the next big thing in terms of user experience outside of the day-to-day. -day. Uh, so it's it not instead of, but in addition to your physical uh, product. Yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Shlomo. I'm a student here uh, in the university. Um, I mean, a few days ago, Jeffrey Katzenberg uh, came to the university to speak, and when he was asked what skill, what attribute can you do to advance in your career, he said to exceed expectations all areas, you exceed your boss's expectations. And I wanted to ask you a similar question. What trait or what defining attribute do you say that you have in your experience in your life has helped you advance in your career and what would you recommend for everyone else here in the room? Yeah, Jeffrey can definitely speak about uh, career success and he's, he's done really well. So he, that, that's, I will take that advice very seriously. Um, and, and always under, promise and over deliver uh, that's the game that you know that we all uh, want to play and um, you know I, I think you know it depends obviously at, at what stage you are in your career but I think every what you really have to do is to be able to achieve defined uh, kind of claim to fame not not fame necessarily in the newspaper 
but inside your organization, where you work, what is that you did that you can say, I was able to, to achieve and, and, and in the benefit of the company? I think every person has to be uh, an entrepreneur in their own world, in that you have to always try to innovate and, and advance your job and take it to the next level. Whatever was there when you came in, or even if it's a new situation, how do you take it to the next level? How do you innovate as, as a quasi-entrepreneur, even in a big corporation, you can still be a, you know, an entrepreneur in your, in your domain, do something that would not have happened if not for you, if you didn't do it, if you didn't think of it on your own. And I really do believe that in, at every level of the organization, it, it is about being collaborative, you have to be a team player. No individual person can be successful alone. You have to be part, work collaboratively. You have to be innovative in the way I, I, I said. You know, how do you innovative? Doesn't mean to uh, to make a, to create a new toy or produce a movie. You can innovate in anything, in anything that you do. There's opportunity to innovate and do things in a better way. Uh, whether you are a receptionist or uh, uh, an accountant, not always within, of course, the, the, in the case of accounting, innovate in, you know, within the, a great framework, but you can still do a better job uh, in, um, in anything that you do. And, and then, of course, ultimately, do you get your job done? Have you achieved what you're supposed to do? Have you executed what your job requires? Uh, and if you do that, I think good things happen. All right, so we're running out of time. So let me just say, all the people that still have questions, please raise your hand. So we'll go with, you'll go first, then you, you, and you, and that will be it. Okay? Please. Um, so I'm wondering, Hot Wheels is like a traditionally boy toy, and Barbies is like a traditionally a girl toy. And do you think that in the next years, because now that the company's focusing more on like diversifying, that the company will also go in a direction, or the whole market of dolls and like boy toys will go in a direction that it'll be like no more differentiation between the two groups? You know, at Mattel, we used to have uh, boys uh, category and girls category, and we changed that. We now have dolls and vehicles, uh, and in photography preschool and action figures and plush and games and building sets. So we don't think anymore in terms of uh, gender. It's fair to say that some play patterns and product more popular within a certain gender uh, but we don't think we, we don't we're not uh, we, we try to create experiences that appeal to everybody and and of course create uh, those experiences in, in the way that speak to children wherever they are and how they think about the world through their eyes and that's been an important evolution for us and you know we don't try to dictate or box any product or any body it's about how do you open and appeal to to all of our consumers in any any way they want to engage with what we do. Great. My name is Natalie. Uh, I'd like to ask you about challenges. Um, you said that uh, you graduated uh, in the United uh, <coughs> States. So what challenges did you have uh, in your beginning? Um, and what challenges do you have I'm very excited to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> because my dream is to work abroad and to make change, big changes that you do. So my question is, what challenges have you had in the past? What challenges, challenges do you have now as a foreigner who works in a global company? Yeah, you know, the, the truth is things change all the time. We always have new challenges in different forms. You know, back in the day when I went to study abroad. Um, I only knew one person in Los Angeles who was my roommate. I, I, because of the military and travel and school, I basically got to the age of 30 and my longest work experience was one year as a windsurfing instructor. Uh, and so the guy, my friend who was my roommate, he was a tennis instructor while I was teaching windsurfing, was the only person I knew in LA. Uh, and so I came in and, and you know, through, through school, 
uh, business school, it was an opportunity for me to know people and, and try to uh, interact and, and engage. And uh, that was a challenge, you know, to find your, your opening. Um, and that was the first, you can say, maybe, you know, career uh, starting point. But since then, every along the way, there are many challenges and you just have to focus on what you try to achieve and feel confident about your goals, that you do them in the right way and, um, and, and plot your, chart your plan. But everything is possible and sometimes when you, one door closes, another one will open. And so you just have to continue going forward and be confident about your plan. No, I think uh, where I, you know, uh, I still have an accent. So back then I had even a stronger accent. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, when I started to work with Chaim Saban uh, and I had, a, you know, a strong accent, uh, he said, why don't we uh, take uh, accent improvement uh, coaching from somebody? Uh, so, you know, you can be a bit more fluent in English. And I said, great idea. So we found someone who was teaching in Hollywood. There are a lot of uh, coaches like that. So we I started to work with a coach. And after maybe four sessions, she started to speak English with an Israeli accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she said, you know, that, that's not way to so give it up. And I gradually over the last 30 years, slowly, slowly continued to work on my accent. But it's, it's about, it's about uh, I think the world is pretty open to people from different places. And you look at, you know, CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world, they're from everywhere. And that is a beauty uh, and, and, a, and a good thing. We, you know, as, as a big company, we still look for early stage opportunities. We have to stay focused on our big, you know, on, on kind of the, the big goals that we have. And it's a, it's a balance. How do you invest or get involved in, in, in small opportunities that can be big? And how do you at the same time focus on the, you know, the, the big activities that actually matter and really move the company forward? Uh, and so we remain open and, uh, and receptive to early stage situations, but we obviously always need to think how do we, how does it quickly and meaningfully move the needle for the a company, you know, rather than, because you can do many little things and if they don't, in the aggregate, don't work, then it's, uh, you know, diverts your, your resource and focus. So it's uh, trying to balance the two together. One last question over there, because we're running out of time. Um, so you, you and you mentioned when you were asked about the role of a leader, you mentioned that one of the most important things is helping the team achieve their full potential. I wanted to ask what you learn and you know what you can um, advise on what is the most important thing in mentoring and helping other people to achieve this full potential. You know, it, it, it really varies by by people. No one is the same as, as another and, and some people uh, need constant, you know, attention and other people will, will feel suffocated if you do that. So it, it really is about how do you adapt yourself uh, to other people rather than the other way around. And it's about uh, ultimately you do need to try and, 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 and believe in, you, in, in, in people that have talent. You need to be quick in recognizing that if things don't work out, they don't work out. Often, you know, in terms of working with people, if you have doubt, there's no doubt, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, there's a saying in Hebrew that describes it pretty well, but I, I really think often it's the case uh, when, you, when you know, you know, you, you know, when you hire a new person, it, it's kind of amazing how quickly, you know, uh, you don't need to wait for months to know if it's working or, or not working. Uh, but, but, you know, you have to be very positive, believe in people, give them the opportunity, empower them. Uh, invest the time and, and, and if people 
do achieve what you what they're you know what you hope they will. Um, just continue to open up more opportunities and create uh, more runway for them to do more. It's all about creating opportunities for others to to be at the best and, re and, and, and reach their potential, which ultimately plays back in the interest of, uh, of the company and the rest of the team. You wanted to ask one last question, please. <laughs> so I can't hear you. Save the worst question to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there, there, are, there are constant uh, challenges, and of course, you don't win every battle. But I try to forget them as soon as they happen <laughs> and move on to the next one. And uh, because you can get caught in, um, you know, in the history. By the way, also in the in the things that did work well. You, it's all about the next, the next situation. Uh, don't dwell on the past. Um, you know, when I started at Mattel, and Mattel has a storied history. Uh, you know, decades and generations. And some of the uh, classic question in the beginning was, you know, why didn't it work before? You know, why, when we started our transformation, why it then started to work? You know, the, the current question, the very timely question, is how come Mattel never made a movie? Um, you know, why did it take 64 years uh, to make the Barbie movie? Uh, so a lot of questions, why it didn't happen in the past and what didn't work in the past? And it really is about, like, it, you can spend a whole career analyzing the past, especially at Mattel, like what happened back then and you know what i try to focus is what is the present and the future sometimes you can pick up things from the past but often it can be distracting and um, and uh, just not helpful because things change and landscape change and i leave you you know just with one maybe story where um, when we launched fox kids in europe we uh, that was uh, i came to do it in in in, in um, you know, in, in the local market, and it's we didn't do you know there was no re we didn't do any research. It, it wasn't about research. We didn't know, we didn't even check who is broadcasting where, not what is the rating or what is uh, the the strength of the competitors. We know it's competitive, and we said okay, we'll figure it out. And the good thing is that we actually did it that way uh, without trying to study and analyze uh, the history before us. Because if we did, we might have not there compete against Disney, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, and many other channels that were ahead of us for, for many years. Uh, we just came in and executed our strategy and, and, and it worked very well. And so, you know, that was an example where you didn't dwell on the past, you didn't, you didn't shackle yourself with, with, the, with, with pre existing situation, you just came in and you followed your strategy and you were able to execute and, um, and, um, and do the right thing. So always try to look forward. Don't gonna question your uh, failures as well as successes. It's all about looking forward. Well, dear friends, Thank you. I think we all. <laughs> I think I'll be, I'll be speaking on behalf of every person in the room if I say that thank you for this really profound deep and enriching experience, learning from the best. You make us all very proud, whether as Tel Aviv University alumni or Israelis in general. And we thank you for everything that you do. And good luck in the future with Barbara and you. beyond. Thank you. Thank you.